Welcome back to The Ground Up Show. My name's Matt Diavella, and today I'm sitting down to speak with filmmaker and YouTuber Caleb Wojcik. On this episode, we discuss transparency, especially when it's related to uh, talking about money and how you're making money online, uh, why it might be a good idea to invest money in yourself, uh, especially early on when you don't have much money to spend, period. Uh, We also break down how he was able to leave his job to pursue a six-figure filmmaking business and the myth of job security. I think you guys are going to really enjoy listening to this podcast. I hope you like it, and let's get right to it. This is Caleb. zombie apocalypse or hitler joke do you have a preference uh maybe zombie apocalypse zombie apocalypse how about nazi you ever play nazi zombies on is what what, what game was that i think it was, it was a call, call of duty? duty game or something yeah did you ever play it or? i played modern warfare one the first one but i didn't really play zombie mode didn't i played play plants vs zombies though i played plants vs zombies as well yeah i used to play that at my desk at my day job because i was so bored oh my god <laughs> on my ipod touch yeah. that is, did you enjoy that game? Because I felt like for me, it was a little bit, it's it's kind of like Just easy. Too easy. Yeah, it's so easy. It's not like they're the easy and mindless. Is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's what you were it's looking similar for. similar to the desk job. Yeah. <laughs> you were looking for something easy and mindless to distract you from easy, easy and mindless. mindless work. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still play video games or not much anymore? I get really addicted to video games. Like when I was in college, I played World of Warcraft and Halo and Guitar Hero till I was the best or till I beat everything. And so I just, I don't really do it much anymore. Occasionally all my friends will be playing something and I'll hop in and play Starcraft two or Diablo three or something years ago, but I used them as an escape before and I don't really feel the need to escape in that way anymore. And Mm -hmm. so now I use movies and film as my escape from work. Mm. Not really video games anymore. I I used to do the Halo parties when I was in high school. Mm-hmm. And I remember talking to uh, a girl and I was like, yeah, me and my friends are going to do a Halo uh, Halo party tonight. And she's like, Halo? Like, what kind of drug is that? <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's like, a pretty wild drug. I don't think you're ready for the this. The nerdiest, like sweatiest body odor kind of like yeah. a bunch of dudes in a basement. Yeah. It's not that romantic of a drug. Um, but that was, it was fun. I really enjoyed those times as like a kid, just kind of not having, um, you know, not having a job, not having any like real responsibilities and being able to just play video games in the middle of the night. I can't do it as much anymore, yeah. but, uh, it was just fun times. You used to do that as well. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah I used to have 15 people over in my mom's basement and people would bring TVs and chairs and Xboxes and just play Halo and do that for 10 hours on a weekend or I used to play poker a lot in high school and dude I play poker too yeah Yeah, in person and then online until it was illegal did you watch rounders oh yeah yeah rounders I think is what like spawned an entire generation of gamblers (laughs) yeah and then ESPN capitalized on it by showing poker on TV and pretending it was a sport and everything yeah Yeah, that's true I totally forgot about that ESPN like was it's funny because I could see a lot of people looking at poker and being like that's the most boring thing in the world to watch but when you kind of understand the game there's so much like and like also when you get to watch it and see what cards people have and see what's going on in their heads and, and see the strategy bluffing, yeah my roommate and i in college other than going to class we would just sit in our dorm and play poker like four tables six tables at a time on our multiple screens and we thought we were awesome but <laughs> You know, we were winning hundreds of dollars. It wasn't a lot of money. But I remember I got so mad I lost like $100 right before a test one time when I should have been studying for the test. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? Why am I playing poker on the internet? This is not worth it. I Mm -hmm. should be focusing on my education or building perfect resume or whatever. So I just kind of stopped playing poker at that point. I kind of miss it a little bit. I don't know. I, cause I, there is an really excitement to it and there's yeah. also like a camaraderie to it when you have like six to eight people over mm-hmm. and you're hanging out um it's it's a lot of fun and, and you know I don't have that in my life anymore like it'll be more intimate like it might be just going out to coffee or lunch with somebody which is great but I feel like there's something that's kind of fun about that dynamic of bringing together like six to eight people to just have a quiet game together and that's a weird thing that happens when you go from high school to college to 
graduating and on to doing whatever, you're in this immediate proximity with the same people every day, whether you're in a dorm or you're going to classes or whatever. And then when you graduate and you go to a desk job or you move to another city and you're an entrepreneur, whatever you end up doing, you only get these one-on-one interactions, these small group things. You don't get the same friends every day, all the time. And that's something I really missed after college. But now with the internet, I feel like I have it and I have friends all over the country. So when I travel, I get to see people or I have to stay in touch with people or Skype or something like Mm -hmm. that. But, and you do these things called masterminds too, right? Mm -hmm. Is that an online thing or an in-person? It started online first. It was every week, four to seven people get on a call, check in. What are you working on this week? What you, what were you supposed to do last week? That sort of thing. But now it's just kind of progressed into in-person once or twice a year. Mm. And it's a two to three day thing. We rent a cool house in a cool place that none of us have really be- ever been to. And during that time, everyone gets a one hour hot seat where they talk about what they're struggling with and what they're working towards and getting feedback on, feedback on things. And then everyone also gets a, a segment at the end of the weekend. So after you've heard everyone like sharing what they want to say, then we do this thing where we pretend like that person's not there and we talk about them. Hmm. And so we came up with this idea because I am always interested in what people think about me. I always thought about this in high school or college. Like I was always worried like, Oh, what does so-and-so think about me? Or like this other thing, but it can also be really interesting to talk about someone like they're not there when they're there. (laughs) It's awkward at first. We're so used to it that when I explain it to other people, they think it's a little weird, but we're so used to it that we can, literally pretend like that person's not there and talk amongst the group of like what we would do if we were them and what we think that they're struggling with and what we wouldn't tell them to their face. Yeah. Like Brian smells really bad. Like we got it. Usually it's business related. (laughs) We try to make it business related. And it's all somewhat appropriate and relevant to uh, helping that person Mm -hmm. on their journey. And then, so we call that unsolicited advice. And then that person can, you know, kind of do a rebuttal. So they, we like welcome them back to the group and then they can ask for clarification or something like that. And at the very end of the weekend, we do a, what I wish for you, which is just, it's more like a kumbaya thing. Like we don't actually play guitars in a circle around a campfire, but it's that kind of, I wish for you to, you know, embrace this thing you're trying to do or to avoid this thing that's giving you trouble or what have you. So it's kind of those three things, the hot seat unsolicited advice and then the what i wish for you what kind of an impact has this these kind of little mini retreats intimate retreats had on your life as well as the people that have, have done it and and would you recommend like is this something that other people should be trying to organize themselves oh yeah for sure i think it's been extremely instrumental in my growth in the decisions i made the pivots i've made in my business from working for other people to working for myself and trying to build all the things I want to build and having a group of people that are either similar age to you or similar amount of experience, or even are building completely different companies. Like I have some people in the group that are building software companies and some people that are authors that write books and I'm a filmmaker and I do a lot of client work. So it's all a little different, but we're investing in each other and we know years of history and we know the patterns Mm -hmm. that all of us kind of get into that allow you to like kind of jab that person or like help them get back on track. Cause you, you've seen the same pattern as opposed to yeah. when you go to coffee with someone that you've only met once and you ask for advice, they're probably just going to be optimistic about what you could do. But it's like, it's like dating a group of people or having a bunch of spouses that know you so well that they probably could give you better advice than you can give yourself. Yeah. I, I mean, the, th- we will answer some questions even later on from Instagram. People have questions, mm-hmm. aspiring filmmakers and those that are trying to build something for themselves, freelancers. Um, and we do our best to, to provide advice and to help steer them in the right direction. And I truly think it's helpful. And I think in a lot of ways, these this kinds of content that is regularly consumed will help you on your path. But I still think that there is going to be that missing gap if you're not actually meeting and connecting with people online, whether it's a mentor or somebody that's on a mutual journey as yourself. Yeah, I mean, I got my first mastermind group in 2011, and people come and go. I've left and joined different ones, but this one that I'm in right now that we only meet in person, we don't meet virtually at all, we've done about five in-person retreats over three or four years, and that is something that I look forward to every year, and I come to it prepared with what I'm struggling with or what I want to get out of it. Kind of like when I attend a conference at the same 
same thing kind of goes through my mind. It's like, who are potential people there that I want to connect with? Who do I want to work with? That's a company that's at a conference. I I'm pretty planned about when I attend an event, but you also plan for serendipity of not planning what you're doing every night or not like trying to only see a list people and like Mm. introduce yourself and try to play that game. I try to invest in the people that are at my current level or peers. And that's what's led to these mastermind groups. That's what's led to potentially I I work for some of the people in my mastermind group. I I get other clients through that. So it's just really helped build my network by not working in a silo, not staying at home, not avoiding events, not avoiding traveling to conferences because conferences are expensive. You got the travel, you got the ticket, you got all that kind of stuff. But if I wouldn't have invested in attending things like that, then I wouldn't have my network. I wouldn't even have a lot of my clients right now. I loved what you said just about connecting with um, people who are on that same journey as you or at that same point as you because a lot of times people just want to connect with those who have achieved success or who have been in the game for a very long time. And for me, I'm like, I, I don't, most of the time, I don't enjoy those conversations and those kind of connections as with people who are going through the same things I'm going through and that we can be, oh, yeah, I tried that. Yeah, that didn't work. Oh, I'm having a hard time, you know, maybe creating this kind of video or this kind of Instagram video. It doesn't seem to be resonating as well as this. And it's like there's a lot more that you can learn, I think, from the people that are doing it at the same time as you than those who are so far removed from it. If you think about somebody who's a a guitarist who's been playing for years and is just incredibly talented, um, sometimes it's harder to teach that, like for that person to teach a beginner than it is for somebody who's only been playing guitar for three months because they're closer to that experience. Mm -hmm. They understand what it's like to not know and to to be in a place of of, um, vulnerability. Yeah, and when I'm at an event and I'm meeting someone new for the first time, I'm always trying to think of how I can provide someone else value because I feel like at conferences where there's a lot of big names there, they give a talk and people stand in line and they like meet and greet and they like are trying to get an autograph or they're trying to get a picture or they're trying to they're kind of trying to take from this person. So when I'm at an event, I'm trying to figure out how I can give to this person. So if I'm at NAB for an example, which is a conference that a lot of filmmaker people go to or people that work in tv or youtube and stuff and there's a lot of gear companies there and i've tried to build connections at a lot of gear companies to get free stuff do reviews that sort of thing so if i know of a company that they might be interested in meeting i will be like hey do you want to go meet so and so at this booth and i'll walk them over there do the introduction i do the same thing with oh have you met this person or what kind of person are you looking to meet at other conferences and that is then I'm always trying to give to somebody. I'm never trying to take from someone in my first interaction with them. Because mm-hmm. to me, that puts you, I was saying this last night at dinner, it puts you at the fan level mm-hmm. and not at the peer level ever. So immediately someone can tell if you're trying to take or give to them. Mm, and it happens across e- every platform, whether it's reaching out through an email, a direct message mm-hmm, on Instagram, mm-hmm. or you're meeting them in person, you're asking for a photo. It's like, uh, if you are, it, it depends what your what your intentions are and what your goals are out of that meeting. If you're truly just a fan and a consumer of content, like, you know, sure, yeah, ask for a photo, whatever. Um, I would also say if you truly do respect that person, um, you know, and it's somebody who's well known, who's getting this a lot, maybe just try to strike up a conversation and thank them for the work they've done. I just had Colin and Samir on the podcast and they were talking about an experience where they met um, Casey Neistat for the first time. And they were so excited to talk with him. And, but the whole time, they were just talking about themselves and almost trying to validate, uh, validate their own careers and mm-hmm. what they had done. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, yeah, like we're, you know, we're doing this, we're doing this. And he's like, wow, that's really cool. I'm, you know, congrats on all your success. And then, all right, see you, bye. And then they just felt so empty. They're like, oh, shit, we screwed that up. What, why didn't we just thank him for all the work he's done? Mm-hmm. And I think that's good advice for any like anybody who's meeting somebody who they uh, are inspired by. It's, yeah, don't approach it as you're a fan per se. Approach it as, you know, hey, thank you so much for the value, you know, what you've created. I got a lot of value out of it. And try not to, like, ask for something. Yeah. Because even, like, if you are offering a compliment, you are adding value. You're, like, making that person feel good about the work that they do. Uh, and I, I think a lot of times we just get so caught up and excited in those moments that we're not really thinking how we're going to feel after them. Yeah. I mean, 
if someone wants to take a picture with me or with whoever, that's great. If they want an autograph, I, I don't think I've ever given an autograph before. But And I also don't expect you to give me a gift or something. But there is a fine line between just respecting that that's a person or that's not an idol mm-hmm. or something. And when you don't think of people that way, you think of them as other humans, then I think people just treat each other better. Right. I mean, you've had a chance to work with a lot of people who are well-known, whether you're interviewing them or working with them or their clients. Um, and at some point, uh, I guess, does it kind of take away this almost mysterious aura that we sometimes give to creators online and, and people who have a voice online, whether they're Insta famous or whatever, uh, is it kind of seeing them as, oh, they're just people. They're just normal guys and girls that are making stuff. And, and you know, their days are just as boring as mine. <laughs> yeah. When I was growing up, I always looked at athletes that way, that they were major celebrities and their life must be so awesome and they make so much money. And then when I was in college, I did some sports broadcast uh, internship stuff where I would go in the locker rooms of professional sporting events after the game of like Detroit Tigers or Detroit Red Wings. And it kind of broke that for me where I saw them and they were just like, they were done with their job for the night. They had to do the interview. And it's the same kind of thing with the people I work with now that might have a bunch of followers on the internet, but they're goofy people too. They joke around. They like star Wars. They like beatbox or whatever. And so it's who beatbox. (laughs) No, don't uh, tell me. No, Pat Flynn. I I mean, Pat Flynn is a beatboxer. Yeah. And my (laughs) wife, my wife laughs about it all the time because we'll be with Pat somewhere random at an airport, wherever, and someone will walk up that's a fan. And that's great. Like he has a big podcast audience and big audience on the internet. And to my wife, it's funny. It's like, Pat's just like everybody else. He's just a regular guy. And I think that's part of what helped him grow his audience. And I think that people resonate with that a lot. But for me, I don't really get that kind of like starstruck around Mm. people at all. I think this leads to uh, something that I wanted to talk about. Um, We can, we look online today, we see a lot of people who are now Insta famous or influencers. They have large followings. Uh, Many of them, it kind of, (laughs) many of them we can honestly say is undeserved. Like there's just a lot of pretty people, men or women who that's their, they just have they're just pretty and they have high quality photos on Instagram and maybe they go got to there cool early places. on. They go yeah. to cool places. They have this really, you know, and, and to their credit, there is obviously something there where they are putting out beautiful imagery. Um, but there's almost an attitude to these people. And I've experienced it, you know, in even reaching out to some people for interviews. And there's a certain tone almost you get to a certain level where you get a certain amount of subscribers or a certain amount of followers. And now you're in a different class. And you do not speak with people who have 5,000 subscribers or whatever. And it's like, how do you view that? And have you seen that in some people online? I've seen it from afar. Most of the people I interact with on a day-to-day basis or get to work with aren't like that, probably because I would choose not to work with people like that. But I think it's, it is tough because you do get inundated with more people asking for your attention. So you do have to have some sort of filter. You have to have some sort of filter that's like, okay, this is an opportunity I would pursue. This one isn't, but it's hard to do that with just people that you meet all the time. So, I I mean, you probably do it with client stuff too, though, where you have people that come to you and they want to work together and their budget's like $300. And you're like, I'm sorry, I can't do that for you. But that carries over to followers and stuff like that too. So Mm -hmm. if you're treating the business interactions that way, that's kind of hard to to navigate between like is this a one that is this one that I should take and is this one not but I do think people get a little bit bigger headed than they need to because they have a bunch of subscribers or followers but they don't really do anything or don't provide value in the way that other people that have jobs provide value if you're just in like an entertainment look at me kind of sense yeah I think it's kind of like the hot girl filter where if you're going to approach uh, a very attractive woman to talk to her who gets approached all of the time, a lot of people are like, and and maybe she shuts you down or she ignores you or she's like, sorry, no, thank you. Um, 
you got to put yourself in this person's shoes who's getting hit on, approached all of the time. Um, and both of you are, are, you and I are in relationships, so we're not hitting on women, but like you can put yourself in that. I thought you were going to say both of us are hot women. So hot, it's like, are hot women. <laughs> yeah, that too. Um, so we, we get it all the time yeah. and it's, it's really, it's hard to keep rejecting people, but put yourself in that person's shoes and like it, that could be exhausting and draining. And so I do see that side of it where if you have lots of followers, of course you can't reply to every message and, and nor should you, if you're getting a thousand emails a day, like that is overwhelming and you probably have better things to do with your time. Um, unfortunately, that's just what happens when things scale out of your control. Uh, that said, I think that there's a tactfulness to it. And I, th- there's, I think there is something though, like apart from just how people act or, or, or treat you when you met, they message you back, but it's almost like, I don't know, the Insta celebrity is almost like a thing where I don't, there's almost no value that they're adding. Mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people are thinking about like, how, what can I provide? Cause a lot of these people may be pushing out an image that is detrimental to other people's well being. When we see somebody traveling all around the world, every photo is incredible. We're comparing ourselves to these people. So they might it's, think it's helping people feel good or happy, but it's actually making them feel worse about themselves. Is that kind of your, in, 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 in a, a way, way you know, yeah. it's just like advertising. It's just like um, marketing messages that we see. Mm-hmm. Um, in a lot of ways, it's it's coming from your own filter. So if you're not happy with yourself, that's you know what I mean? It's almost like, is that that person's problem if they're putting up beautiful photos? Uh, I, I don't know. It's more of a question than, a, than an answer. Yeah, I'd love to hear what other people think. Like in the comments or on Twitter or whatever yeah. to, to, this, to this end of people that are just internet famous. And I think it it's similar to money where if you have more money, it doesn't solve your problems. It just solves your money problems. I think that's, uh, I think Josh says that of the mm-hmm. minimalist. He said that on a podcast recently. And it's like, if you get more followers, it's not going to make you better of a person. It's just going to amplify who you are, whether you are at the top of YouTube and you do stuff that's controversial or you're on Instagram or what have you. I think that it's just going to amplify the person you really are and if that's a disingenuous person or someone that isn't providing actual value to the world that they're just they just have a lot of followers and they get to have people do sponsor posts and that's all they do then that's who they are yeah and i mean i guess to to the the side of it that's not so uh, Debbie Downer, <laughs> where it's like, oh, the world is lost. Like all these people are just insta famous and are like, um, aren't adding any value. It is, it really touches on the world we live in and the fact that there are so many different characters and different people and people who have different interests and values. And uh, maybe it's not such a bad thing. Maybe that's actually what separates you. Well, you know, maybe somebody else is over here and and they are talking about something that's uh, more material in nature, jewelry, whatever it is. Maybe they're passionate about it. Maybe they're not. But then you can add something else to the the conversation. You can bring something else to the table. Yeah, and I think why I'm concerned about it is the generation behind us of people that aspire to have their career be a YouTube celebrity or to be Instagram famous, and they don't know why other than they see other people that have that and they look happy and they get to do all these cool things and go to all these different places. And so they think that that subscriber count is what they need or they need more followers when really it's, it's something else that they want yeah. to, to, to be happy. And I was at vid summit last year and Gary Vaynerchuk was doing some Q and a, a kid came up, I think he's probably 11 or 12 years old. And Gary asked him what he wanted. Like, why were you, why are you doing YouTube? And he's like, I really want 300 subscribers. And Gary was like, but why? Like, I can get you 300 subscribers like that. And by the time the kid sat down from asking his question, he had 300 subscribers because Gary was like, what's your channel? And everyone in the room followed him. He's like, okay, you have 300 subscribers. Now what do you want? And so it's like thinking beyond the number because the number will always just keep growing. And have you, as you've had your like success and the hockey stick recently of you were saying a few months ago, you were at a few thousand subscribers. Now you have six figures of subscribers on YouTube, but internally that's not changing anything. And that's a, mm-hmm. that's a wonderful barometer to have, to not have the number be changing the kind of stuff you make if possible. 
the kind of lifestyle you have, the kind of people you want to meet and interact with. I know it's opening doors perhaps to be like, oh, this person is of this value. And I get that too, because when I reached out to gear companies, I wanted to do a, a review about this piece of equipment. They'd be like, oh, your channel's not big enough. And that hurts. It's like, uh, like screw you. Like, uh, I, I could do a really good job, but for them, they need the reach. If they're going to give you something for free or they're going to pay to promote something, then they gotta, they gotta get the reach. But if you can do what you want to do until you get to whatever number you want to get to and then keep doing it, I think that's really powerful. Cause mm-hmm. I think people get to a certain level of subscribers and then they feel like they have to change. They're like, oh, now I have all these people expecting this from me or what I used to make. I think you just use that as the opportunity to now make what you really wanted to make in the beginning. You're always going to get to that place. If you're, if you're working hard towards your goals and, you know, uh, I, although I would say that your goal shouldn't be 100K subscribers mm-hmm. or whatever it is in the first place. But for me, it was even, um, you know, I wanted to be able to make, make it as a freelancer. That was my first big thing it was like if i could make a living and i didn't have a number in mind it was just like if i could pay the bills and make videos dream come true i got it now what make a feature length documentary about something i care about got it now what and then i realized oh okay you know as much as like i enjoyed the 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 journey and everything that i was going through at the time you're always going to be asking that question now what uh maybe the better thing to do is like you said before you get to the goal figure out what that now what is figure out it's it's yeah there may be a practical like okay i want to work on this kind of project or do this kind of thing and that's going to change as you evolve and as you create bigger and bigger projects or more exciting projects but understanding what's motivating the underworkings of that i think that's important it's to ask now what before you get there yeah and everyone talks about the ira glass quote about creativity and making what you really want to make and the gap between Oh, I, I know quality. I know this is how good of a film I want to make, or I want to take photos that are this good or make music that's as good as this person. But your, your taste is different than your actual skill level. And everyone talks about that, but this gap between what you actually want to be doing and what do you have to do to get there? So you said full length feature, for example, you couldn't do that right away. Mm. You had to work your way to that. And it's hard to back up all the different steps of everything that you need to do to get to where you want to go or who you have to work with and to plan it all out and everything. But at least knowing the direction you're heading in, at least knowing I want to go to New York or I want to go to LA versus getting in the car and not knowing like the cardinal direction you want to head in and you're just driving and you're like, Mm -hmm. well, I'll figure it out if I do it long enough. Yeah. And, and saying like, Oh, what do I enjoy doing today? Was, was learning how to shoot video or take photos, was that fun? Did I enjoy that process? Then maybe that's something that you should continue to explore. Um, last night we were talking about transparency online. Mm-hmm. But how do you view being transparent online? Especially like we were talking about a lot of these finance bloggers or, or writers, people will share their financial reports. And to me, there might be a line where Again, you don't want people to be feeling shitty because maybe you are doing so well. Like it's easy to share your financial report when you're making $30,000 a year. But then when you're making $400,000 a month or you're making these Mm -hmm. crazy sales, I could see where it would be detrimental to the people that are seeing it because they automatically, as humans, default setting, compare yourself to other people. Um, Where does transparency work online and, and where does it maybe hurt? Where, where I first interacted with it was with debt and debt in general is just an embarrassing topic that people don't talk about. And when people were talking about how they got out of debt, uh, I mean, Dave Ramsey does all this stuff, but I was following like JD Roth and Trent Ham of the simple dollar and a bunch of other personal finance bloggers like 10 years ago. And that is an embarrassing thing, but to talk about it and to share how they got out of debt and how they progressed through it is an inspiring thing for someone else that's in debt. And on the other side of making money, it can be an inspiring thing to see exactly how someone is making money on the internet or how they're making money through affiliate income or course launches or advertising on their website or their YouTube channel or what have you. So knowing how it's actually done 
can be inspirational enough for someone to learn how to do it and then they can start to do it. So if people hadn't been sharing on the internet how they made money, I wouldn't have known the different ways I could have made money or I maybe wouldn't have been inspired to quit my job because I didn't know that it was even possible. So it with the debt and with the early smaller amounts of money, it is a little bit more achievable and inspiring for people, but I do agree that it can get out of control. So you're sharing millions of dollars or what have you, that's not as inspiring. Um, it doesn't seem attainable, but if you go back far enough to when it was a little bit more attainable or they were first starting, there's probably more lessons in that when they were making a few thousand a month or maybe 10,000 a month, but not hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. Where that's one thing as a creator or somebody that's, you know, pushing content out, you can change your approach where in the beginning, maybe you can be totally transparent and show all these reports because, um, there are lots of lessons to learn from that. And then maybe once you get to a certain level, you may decide, Oh, it's probably actually going to be hurting people more than it's going to be helping. So, uh, maybe I won't do these monthly financial reports every month. I I used to post my net worth every single month when I was a personal finance blogger. For, for what reason, I don't know. But I felt like that was what I needed to do. I needed to share mm-hmm. the progress. But it held me accountable to myself because I didn't want that to go down. So maybe I wouldn't buy something that month because I didn't want my blog post next month to be worse than it was the month before. Um, so it, it had that effect on me. But I eventually stopped doing that because I stopped talking about personal finance. And I would be super transparent about my business now as much as people want to ask me about it. But I'm not super front upfront about it mm-hmm. because I don't want it to intimidate people too much or be like, Oh, I make six figures. Like here's yeah. how you can do it. And I don't want to be the sleazy internet person that's bragging about how much they make or anything like that. But in private conversations or if someone emailed me and asked me, like I'm happy to share how I make money or how much money I make. And maybe I just need to be a little bit more transparent with it too on my YouTube channel or to my to my email list. Mm. The one thing that I liked about the transparency conversation was also talking with your audience about how you make money Mm -hmm. and who's paying you Mm -hmm. and how much is coming from sponsors. And so, yeah, this is, this is a soapbox that I could get on for sure. So there are a lot of people that make money in ways that isn't very transparent to the people that consume what it is that they, they make and legally, federal trade commission wise FTC, you have to say that something is advertising or you have to say that something was provided by someone. And on Instagram now, you know, they have that thing on the post right under their name where it's usually the location is, you know, like paid sponsorship by, and you legally are supposed to do that if someone gives you money. And it's just a gray area on the internet right now of how people make money. They do advertising. That's a little bit more clear because it's an ad read or you see a logo or something like that. But in other ways, it's not so clear. People don't disclose stuff. And it, it kind of just rubs me the wrong way to watch a video and know that they're getting paid to make it, but they're not really disclosing it. And so I at least can control what I do. And so I'm super upfront. If I've bought a piece of equipment, I say that like mm-hmm. I bought this with my own money mm-hmm. and I often do that or I'll rent a camera to review it. I rented Canon C200 for a few hundred dollars or Panasonic EVA one for a few hundred dollars from like lens pro to go or something because I wanted to rent it. And that was the only way I can get my hands on it. And that comes out of my pocket, but companies do send me stuff. So if I get something on loan from B and H, I disclose that if I get something sent to me from a company, I disclose that. And I haven't been paid to make a video yet from a company, but if I did, I would disclose that. And I personally would kind of want to go as far as saying how much I got paid too. Mm. Like it influences the viewer of what they think of what you're saying. Because if you're reviewing something and it's positive and you got paid to do it, it's this weird limbo of where, where your opinion comes from. Yeah. What are your overall thoughts on advertising today? It, it, It seems like sponsorships have kind of run wild where everybody's just grasping you know like i see a lot of people kind of 
uh, that's like some of their main advice for like people who are like content creators on the on the rise and just kind of making stuff. And um, it's like, yeah, like so this is how you get your first sponsorship deal. This is how you like you find somebody to to pay you to you know plug their product or whatever. And it seems like almost they're not they're not focusing on the the important thing. They're just focusing on what's the quickest way that I can make money out of this thing, which is kind of a tough position to be in when you're just trying to find brands to pay you money to make content. It's like maybe they're missing a dot there that they need to connect in terms of like focusing on making great shit first. I mean, I've, I've sold a text link on my website like eight years ago for 50 bucks. And I was like, why did I do that? I don't think it's there anymore. I would hope mm-hmm. it's not there anymore, but just for some term that someone to rank for an SEO and why did I do that? And at that point, it was just, I wanted to make money from the thing that I was working on on the side. I wanted to validate that this thing could do what I wanted to do. And it's easier from the other side to be like, oh, I have enough money. I can say no to these things. But when you're trying to build that thing to be your full-time thing, it's a little bit harder to be like, uh, sorry, I won't take a thousand dollars to do this Instagram post. But to me, when I see stuff that doesn't relate at all if it's clothing or something that's just not related to the content that they are already making or what they're already sharing it it turns me off honestly Mm -hmm. it just it's weird I don't I don't like it I understand being a creator that you have to pay the bills you you have to pay for the equipment you have to eat food and have a roof over your head but it, it just gets it gets weird for me so I've been really hesitant about wanting to incorporate sponsored things or advertising too much in my stuff yeah i think the best path for these people and we're talking about filmmakers photographers musicians like there's this these are arts that people pay for that you can find clients i really think client work is one of the best ways to get into it uh for me it was very very much a practical approach where i'm like i graduated with a lot of debt Mm -hmm. a lot of student loan debt and I had to figure out a way to pay those bills and I didn't want to live at my parents house for five years after graduating I knew I was gonna have to put in a couple years but I'm like all right I gotta I gotta start hustling making some money um and if my first step was build an audience to eventually you know turn that into a way to monetize I feel like it's such an uphill battle that you know doing that within a couple years and it's also the chances of that working out are kind of, you ha- it's a long game. You got to play that long game with yeah. it and not expect that you're going to be able to uh, pay off your student loans and, and, you know, move out of your parents' house within a couple of years. Uh, so for me, it was like, all right, how can I start making money today? Weddings, bar mitzvahs. You know, there's so much, it's very easy. Um, I don't, it's not that easy, but it it's easy enough and it's way easier to get that kind of money than it is to get those sponsorship deals or building an audience first uh, because you have to have a very large audience to be able to make legitimate money online on YouTube. You got to be getting millions of views to be able to pay the, pay the bills. Um, so is that, how, and I want to talk about your, your story a little bit too, but do, do you agree with that kind of approach where maybe that's the way to go, go freelance and then transition into this thing? Cause I know you're in the middle of that transition as well. Yeah. I think that the numbers game is a hard one to play when you're talking advertising or, or sponsored, you just have to have very large audiences. Even if you're in a niche space of something that's very specific, you still have to be close to the middle or top of the people in that to even make anywhere near enough. Mm-hmm. And the amount of time that you might spend to chase a hundred dollars, $200 here or there, it's probably not worth it. And so it'd be much more worth it to find yeah, clients or keep your full-time job and not sell out early to, to, to advertising and that sort of thing until you reach the level where you could offer something in a different way. And, and even when you said monetize, like that word of like, oh, I want to monetize my audience. To me, it always comes down to like, what are you selling? Because if you're selling advertising, your audience is... The, they're the people you're selling. You're selling their attention to Crest or whoever else wants to run. This podcast is brought to you by Crest. (laughs) Crest Toothpaste, yeah. (laughs) So you're selling them. Yeah. Versus you're selling something to your audience. 
and that's that's a different relationship Hmm. and yes when people go to youtube they're used to seeing ads before videos they don't really connect that you are selling their attention and that ads there i i personally when i go to youtube and i see an ad i kind of blame youtube i don't really blame the channel but it's the channel or the person's choice whether there's an ad before my video 100 percent. yeah so i think youtube is an interesting thing where you don't really get the blame as the creator as the channel Mm -hmm. but for a podcast if there's an ad on there like i know for sure that the podcast chose to put that there yeah the person read the ad or whatever it was yeah or the episode starts with five to ten minutes of ads and then closes with a few more minutes and i'm just like come on and everyone skips them like so what is going on here like what uh, why is that okay game Yeah, yeah why is it okay and like why are people paying so much money for those ads when a lot of people are skipping them um and because in a lot of ways we're trying to cre- many podcasts are conversations like this mm-hmm. and when you start a conversation imagine if i were to actually read the ad before we even start or in the like, middle yeah it, it, it's a disruption and it in, and a distraction from the actual conversation it feels like billboards at an nhl game mm-hmm. or when they project a like an ad on the soccer field now or it's just like I understand that that's how the machine works. That's how professional sports work. That's how television works is episodes are 22 minutes long because there's eight minutes of ads for the half hour time slot. Like that's how think TV channels get paid. That's how shows get made. But I think there's a lot of interesting platforms out there now, like Netflix pay them monthly. They do whatever they want. They spend all their money and they make all these cool shows and there's no ads. It's, it's a more direct connection. Yeah. And I think with I think with platforms like Patreon, like now you can s- sponsor YouTube channels and pay five dollars a month to get more stuff. Still think that's a little weird because YouTube's always been a free platform. But I think we're getting closer to the direct connection between a creator and the person consuming whatever that is, and they're not being a middle person that has to be involved, like an advertiser, like a sponsor for that connection mm. to happen. Right now we live in a world where um, that's the easiest way for people to monetize. And I do not blame people who knows, maybe I'll do it in the future. Um, but we're hoping that we can get to a point where even Patreon and these other platforms just become more of the new norm right now. It, there's not that direct connection. It's like when you, the, the economy and the transaction economy, just, it just feels more natural to give somebody a dollar and get an apple. But then when you have to give somebody, uh, somebody gives you an apple and then you give them a dollar every once in a while, like it just, you know what I mean? The, yeah. the direct connection isn't there. Hopefully we work towards it and, and fix this problem. Yeah. Cause it does feel a little broken. It does feel a little like just shady in a way of just yeah. like, I have to make money by doing this thing so that this other company will pay me. But then. I yeah, got to give just, you, and then I got to give you extra stuff through Patreon to, to like inspire you to want to pay me. Yeah, that's usually more, what happens. More junk, more distractions. Right. To, yeah. I got to give you another AMA episode every month, you know, so the people on the Patreon have incentive to actually do it. And then it's like, what, the, what is going on here? It's, it's, uh, it's not working, but anyway, uh, hopefully that we'll, we'll fix that. It's not going to, we'll know. fix it. We'll fix it. Maybe, you and me. maybe one, a listener will come up with a solution. Um, you, you graduated in the middle of the global financial crisis, right around that. Luckily time. a couple months before the recession, a couple months before. So you were yeah. able to actually get a job. Yeah. Tell me about that experience. So in college, I just worked on having a really good resume. I just really wanted a job. Like I really wanted to have security. I wanted to have a good paycheck. I wanted to pay off my student loans. I wanted to pay off my debt pretty quickly. And I graduated in May of 2018, got a job at the Boeing company, moved out to Seattle, Washington. 2008, sorry. Yeah. 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 And a few months into that, just huge layoffs at the company. I had spreadsheets that showed the people that had to be laid off at the factory I worked at. And I was in charge of going into the meetings and sitting there with all the managers and being like, okay, so how many people can you let go of in three months? Two? Okay, that's got to be five. So if you can go figure that out and come back. And I didn't say it like that. But that was kind of my role Mm -hmm. in this this job. And that was a few months after college. And I just saw that, you know what? Corporate life's not for me. I got to kind of 
take care of myself. And so I survived the layoffs. I stuck in that job for a little bit longer, but the whole time on the side, I was reading books about entrepreneurship and just trying to figure out what I was going to do that wasn't going to be at a desk job. And how did you know when you were ready to make that transition? Because that's a huge transition. Was it, and was it the instability of this environment where you're like, well, nobody's really got a guaranteed shot at it. A lot of people, there's almost a myth of job security where mm-hmm. people feel like I have a job, therefore I have this safety net and I'm always going to have a paycheck. When in reality, the only kind of security you can have is to be incredibly talented and valuable to the economy. Yeah, I would say that people that have a job where they have a regular paycheck, like at any time, they don't have control of that. They aren't the ones that could turn it on or turn it off. And I saw that at at the company I worked at. I saw people that were there for 20 or 30 years, get laid off, have to go home and have to find another job or do whatever. So I always assumed that that was way safer than being an entrepreneur, than running your own business and back to what you just said, I think having the skill set, having a network of people, that's way safer than being on, on paper, on a resume with a bunch of diplomas, having a job. How did you make the jump? So how did you go from nine to five to a freelance life? So I slow and steady. I, I found a job working for one other person. It was, it was an online entrepreneur, a blogger, his name is Corbett Barr, ran a website called Think Traffic. And so I went from a company of 140,000 people to a company of two. And that's where I learned a lot about the world of internet business, growing an audience, podcasting, making videos, all that kind of stuff. And through working with him, I got to meet a lot of people that were doing that. And that was kind of how I learned. So Mm -hmm. I didn't just quit my job, take the leap, no plan. I kind of sidestepped to working for a mentor. And I didn't know that eventually I would leave working for him, but that whole time I was learning, I was kind of seeing how people did this stuff. Mm. And you left Boeing and you started making a ton more money. Oh no. I took a a big pay cut. I lost my 401k. I lost my health insurance, started paying a thousand month for Cobra health insurance. And you know, I took a huge pay cut. It was not financially a good decision at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, right after getting married. I think sometimes you have to make these decisions though that are either lateral movements where you're like, I'm going to work at this company and I'm not going to, I'm going to be getting paid the same amount of money, but I'm in a role that's going to be closer to the direction where I want to head. Um, Or you can even take a step back like that where you're leaving the workforce entirely and you're getting paid, you know, a fraction of what you used to be getting paid, especially when you take into account all these extra things that jobs sometimes provide, like health insurance and and whatnot. So that's a huge shift and a huge risk. Like, how how did you manage it? How did you manage to leave your job not making as much money? Um... And also having all these other expenses you need to cover, like, that's, that's a challenging thing to navigate. Yeah, I was just rereading um steven pressfield's turning pro and there he talks about the these two kind of salaries that you have you have the the tangible salary of your paycheck your benefits all that kind of stuff and then you have the the psychological salary and to me that was my commute to to my desk job sitting under fluorescent lights looking at spreadsheets being really bored and so I would rather have the freedom and flexibility to work from wherever I wanted, doing cool stuff with learning new skills, meeting new people that were doing what I eventually wanted to do. And that was worth more than the money, than the benefits. And so it's, it's hard when you try to explain that to your parents and they're like, so (laughs) you, you went to college for four years and you got a good job making more money than we make, uh, in a cool city across the country. And you're going to work for a blogger. Like, how is this, how is this going to work? But luckily my parents have always trusted in me and they were okay with it. Once I explained what a blogger did to make money on the internet, but it's a different, a little bit of a different world back then yeah. where it's not as today. That's kind of almost what a lot of people aspire to. And even really? parents, I think are a little bit more in tune, but mm-hmm. at this time it was, that's a little bit more of a risky decision because it's a little bit unknown where this whole thing is heading. Yeah. But it's just a matter of 
there were other things I valued more than money at that point. I, I paid off my debt and I was willing to, to take a risk. Mm. And even at that time you, you started to invest in yourself, even when you maybe didn't have the money to spend, like spending what $500 to go to a conference, Mm -hmm. like talk about some of those experiences and, um, (laughs) It might be hard to recommend somebody who's only got that that only has five hundred dollars to maybe spend that on something that's potentially life changing. But in a lot of ways, that's almost it means way more to that person. Yeah, it's just like I can't recommend that someone spend tens of thousands of dollars on a red camera or something like that, or you invest a bunch of money in whatever the the thing is you really want, or the event you really want to go to, or a city you want to visit to meet a certain person. But sometimes those monetary investments, they, they legitimize that you're really committed to something. So not that I recommend that someone go into debt to do that, but I, I did. Like we invested in cameras when my wife started her wedding photography business. And that not only legitimized her to clients and to the people she worked with, but internally how serious she was about doing that. And so attending conferences that people were at doing what I wanted to be doing and investing money in that and taking time off work to go do that. It's something that I'd recommend that people do. You, there's a couple ways you can do it. I mean, you could do low, uh, thresholds in terms of monetary cost where maybe it's buying a book. Yeah. Right? I think like you always, always or library. Go, yeah. Library. Yeah, yeah. You could do a library, but, uh, I, I think everybody should have $10 to spend on a book and maybe that might even be a little bit for me, at least if we were talking about this too, where it's like, we will go out and we'll spend a hundred dollars on a dinner, mm-hmm. but then we're like, candy at the movies it's like "Ah, i don't know it's a little bit more expensive here maybe we should buy candy before we get here and it's like but the ten dollars for a book is even though that's not a lot for me it actually is enough for me to be like i I need to read this book now yeah i always call that being penny smart and dollar dumb (laughs) you're like you're like oh like this gas station is like four cents cheaper so i'm gonna like drive and like have to turn left on this intersection it's like dude just get gas and go home like it's not that big a deal but then i'll spend thousands of dollars on lighting for my, for my client work or something. And that's an investment. So maybe that's a little different, but still thinking through, yeah, like what financial decisions really make sense and really make a difference. And if going to a conference, meeting people, buying a piece of equipment for the kind of art you do or to, to, to progress you further, or that's going to school for some people because they need that degree they need that certification to move on to the next level i think it's willing to you know you should be willing to take some of those risks sometimes what's the best financial advice that you've received not live beyond your means and then try not to have lifestyle creep Mm because lifestyle creep is probably the biggest thing that puts people in trouble and that's when you make more money spend more money so most people as they get older they start to make more money and if you can live like you lived when you were in college or shortly thereafter for as long as possible, you're just going to have this gap of money to play with, whether that's to save for retirement, to pay off your debt or to bring you closer to the life you want to live or career you want to have. So that's probably the biggest one for me was I was super frugal when I had my day job right out of college. And that allowed me to pay off $30,000 of debt. And I know you, very similarly, you try to live within your means and be minimalist as much as possible. And that enables you to open up the freedom to then do what you want to do. Yeah. And I think that was the biggest thing is understanding the, where you want to go and what that freedom will give you. Cause it wasn't just paying off debt so I could, you know, buy a car or buy Mm -hmm. a house Mm -hmm. or whatever. It was paying off my debt. So I'd have the freedom to make the choices that I wanted to make. And I could, have riskier decisions or I can travel the world. It just opens yourself up so much, but you see so many people. I saw so many uh, friends just make more and more money and like hundreds of thousands of dollars, like making a couple of my friends making over $150,000 a year. And that's not like revenue. That's like what they're making. Um, And they have all these benefits and a bonus and everything on top of that. And they have no money. And I'm just thinking, how the hell do you have no money? Where's all your money? You're you're not paying off any of your debt. Um, 
how is that possible? Yeah. Is it, 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 I think creep is the word, right? Where it just creeps up on you. And you just slowly start to make these decisions without even thinking about them. Yeah, and I do this with my business. It's also really easy when you have a business or you have this thing you're working towards and you're like, oh, this is a write-off or I'm investing in myself. And so you can get into that trap of just spending and spending and spending. And that's usually where it comes from. It's not that people have a money-making problem. They have a money-spending problem. And so it's really important to to track it. I used to track everything that I spent when I was at my day job line by line. If I bought food, if I bought anything, I would spreadsheet like enter it all then now it's more automated and i have accountant and stuff but mm-hmm. but just seeing your spending habits that really helps with the mm-hmm. lifestyle creep and you know choosing choosing a partner choosing a life partner a spouse a boyfriend girlfriend that values some of the same things you do like that that's really important too because that's where a lot of it can come from is the expectation of external parties and not you know, internally, what do you really want and what do you really value? Like I drive, I drive a car that I've had for 10 years. It's a 2004 Toyota Camry. It has almost 300,000 miles on it. And I, I have so much, so much camera gear and equipment. And I value that stuff because it helps me do my work. I don't really value the car that drives me there. And so I spend a lot of money on that stuff and we have insurance that has to cover that stuff. That's more important than my car insurance with the car because my car is not worth much. Mm-hmm. And so it's just like, where do you value? What do you value? And, and how do you value it? I put a lot of, we spent a lot of money on where we live because we work from home. So versus if we didn't work from home, we could spend less money. And it's just, those are the types of things you have to, to do the math on. So I don't have a nice car, but I have a nice camera and that, is an asset that helps me make money versus something that's just a payment. You, you got to start today. Like it's, it's, you can never be sometime in the future. You need to take responsibility for your finances. Yeah. And I, I've, I've had plenty of lifestyle creep in where I live. I grew up in rural Michigan. I now live in Southern California and it's way more expensive. We eat organic food. So we like spend a lot of money on that. We live in a nice place. I have nice equipment for my job. And so I have plenty of lifestyle creep. And it wasn't like it was only because I made good decisions out of college to get a good job, pay off my debt, invest in retirement, put money in a 401k, put money in a Roth IRA. And then when times got tough, I could take money out of my Roth if I wanted to, to like, like, I don't have any clients this month. Like, I need to, to bridge that gap. And it's because of past decisions financially that enabled me the freedom to, to do what I wanted to do and to keep going versus having to revert back to a desk job again. You've built a really successful freelance filmmaking business. You kind of stumbled, stumbled into filmmaking there. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you start to get clients? And, and how would you recommend people get clients today. I want to say specifically clients that are doing things that are exciting and you find interesting. You've had the chance to, like you said, you, you work with Pat Flynn, Corbett Barr, people who are doing, uh, inspiring things who have large audiences where you can create content and videos that are going to be seen by a lot of people and, and influence a lot of people. Uh, in a lot of ways, I think that those are the ideal clients to shoot for. You know, there's certainly clients that aren't as desirable mm-hmm. that don't give you as much creative control over um, what you're putting into it. So how do you get g- great clients as a freelance filmmaker, but really just a freelancer? To me, it's really come down to knowing people in person. And that's come from attending events, going to conferences, meeting people in person, and then having the reputation of what you do to, to kind of back that up. So I stumbled into it a little bit because when I was working with Corbett at Fizzle, we were doing a lot of video training and we were making a lot of video content. And that was where I really got into the technical part of how to make videos. But then everyone in this sphere of, you know, internet business and entrepreneurship and that sort of thing, that's what I became known as was like the video person. Mm. And I also started to brand myself as that. So I made up the name DIY video guy. And then that was kind of my personal brand on the side of teaching people how to make videos so that when I met someone, they knew that my thing was video. So I think it's a combination of 
having the thing, like, what do you want to be known for? And then you have to meet lots of people that are potential clients. And so I went to three to four conferences a year that these people were going to be at. And I built the network and I invested in people at my peer level. And I didn't try to go meet the A-listers like we were talking about earlier. And reaching out to people directly was another way that I got clients was like, hey, I want to work with you. Do you need, do you have any video stuff that you need? Just super hands off, not try to be super pushy, but emailing people that I'd already had a personal connection with. Like I would say 80 to 90% of my clients over the past three and a half years I met personally. And the first time I met them wasn't just to like do, to work together. It was mm. building, building friends and mm. building friends that run cool businesses was, was kind of how I did it. Do you ask for referrals? Like if there's certain people you're working with, do you like ask them if they know anybody who might be interested in hiring a filmmaker? I, a or couple times, much. but it's never really led to anything. Mm -hmm. It's, it's more just showing up and doing a good job for people and your name will just kind of get spread. And that's, that's probably not very good advice to hear because if you're not doing work now that you want to be doing, then it's, it's really hard to, to even start. But I mean, I started the same way a lot of people do it. They make videos for free. They make videos for like uh, the first wedding video I shot, I was attending the wedding. I filmed it. And then when my wife had wedding photography clients or other people reached out, I could be like, Hey, I made this wedding film. They don't need to know you did it for free. So it's that kind mm -hmm. of thing. You gotta like build your reel and you gotta do all these things. And then you do work that's not for your reel. It's just, it's just for the meal and you don't show that work and you just kind of slowly go from there and keep reinvesting the money into building your skills and training or the equipment you need and going to events was the biggest thing. Just meeting people mm -hmm. that were potential clients. Right. I think the reinvesting is huge too. That was from the very beginning, the first hundred dollars I ever made, I put in the headphones. I was like, which is hilarious because headphones don't like make you make a better video. They might make you edit a little better, but it wasn't like a let, like it was it, like, a, it was like an editing thing, which I think not, is really funny. Not as much actually. Cause it was, um, cause I was running around. Oh, so with, during recording for headphones. filming gotcha. yeah, okay. the over the ears. And I, I actually used it for everything, but versus like the earbuds in your ears mm -hmm. while you're mm -hmm. filming, uh, when you're at that point, I'm like recording, doing everything. And I, I, I still actually recommend like, like actually what's been great about your journey too, is that you've you know, you got a full-time editor now which is amazing and like for somebody who's a filmmaker that's probably like the first thing that you would want to do because that's the majority of the work is in, in the editing um but you've stayed relatively small and you've been able to have a great margin of profit like at least 50 percent of every video is is or in at least project is is profit which i think is what most people should be aiming for like if you're if you're margin and i know a lot of people some of my friends who they put everything they have into their videos and they only have a 10% profit margin on a video, 15%, like sometimes smaller. And I'm like, come on. What are they spending all the money on other people to help or rent like, equipment say if you're or shooting a music video? They're getting dollies. They're getting, they're paying for big crews they are paying this. Oh, there's just no budget for it. My mentality is, well, if they don't have a budget for it, then we're not making the video. Mm -hmm. You're not taking the project. And I understand some people get into a trap where they are working these low budget projects and they, they need it to pay the bills. But I think that's where we can take these financial practices and make sure your bills aren't as big, you know, maybe stay like cut expenses as low as you can. So you don't have to just grind yourself out because you're never going to get out of that hole. Yeah. And like I find clients that can pay the prices that I want to charge too, is another tip of if you want to only make $500 a video, then go knock on local business doors. Like that's, yeah. those are the, that's going to be what they can pay, mm -hmm. you know, a few hundred dollars. If you want the kind of clients that can pay you what you want to charge, you got to go get them. You got to find them. They might not be in your city. You might have to fly to them. You might only find them on the internet mm -hmm. and you just kind of have to do that research to know, to know where they're going to be. Do you have advice for people who are looking to set up a retainer? I think that that that's one thing that helped me out so much early on was finding I had maybe two or three uh, retained clients over the years. 
Um, but it's like not just having a one-off project because getting clients is very tough, but having recurring clients makes your life so much easier. You're, you know, a lot of people think the only way that you can increase your income is by getting more clients, but the easiest way is actually to get old clients, clients you already have to pay for more work. Um, so what advice do we have for people who are looking to set up a retainer? Yeah. Retainers are really strong thing to have because they are just a nice baseline to have for when you have ebbs and flows in your business. And so you don't have to chase as many clients sometimes, or you can say no to ones that aren't the best fit or going to waste your time or aren't enough money, but to actually get them, I never would pitch that as the first thing. So I would yeah. definitely work with someone the first time. And then it has to be someone that depending on what you do or make has that ongoing need and mm -hmm. has the want to keep doing work. And so right now I, I have just one retainer, but I also have a lot of repeat clients. So repeat clients are kind of like retainers that are just unofficial, but I think that the best way to get them is to approach them with a plan, like show up and be like, these are all the things we could do for this price. Are you willing to work together? And obviously it has to be at some, it has to be someone that's at a level that they can basically hire somebody sometimes or a, a part-time person to, to get to the point of being able to pay for a retainer to pay hundreds or thousands of dollars a month. It's like hiring employees. Mm -hmm. So you have to, you know, put yourself in their shoes. Like, are you, are they even going to be able to afford this? But you just have to think of enough things that you could do that would help them. And then the bottom of that pitch or conversation or page should be what they could then make from that. Mm -hmm. or how they would save money. And so like my retainer right now maybe charges more than if they hired a video person, but I also have an editor and I have more capabilities that they get from, from paying my company a retainer than if they hired one person. So mm -hmm. it, it just kind of has to be a really good match and you have to be able to legitimize what you can do for them. Right. What kind of value you can give them and what are they getting out of it? Like, are they getting some kind of return on the investment when you're for retainers or otherwise, uh, most projects, are they project based or hourly rate based? I don't charge hourly yeah. anymore. Have you, you did in the beginning um, a little bit for some editing work I used to, but it just doesn't make sense to do it that way. I don't really like to charge hourly. I don't think it incentivizes us to work efficiently. I don't think that it's fair for them to not really know how much it's going to cost. The only the only thing that I right now charge hourly is I have a motion graphics person that I work with. And to be fair to him, I have no idea how long a certain motion graphics thing is going to take. If it takes longer, I don't want him to feel like he's not getting paid what he should be paid. So that's the only thing I really charge hourly for. And that's to one of my contractors. I never do it to my, to my clients. I always gotcha. do project base and it can hurt you sometimes to, to not know how much work something's going to be, but that's where it comes to doing really good research, asking the right questions before you do a proposal for how much it's going to cost. I mean, you know, you know, this stuff of yeah. uh, doing a project and then being like, okay, I need to update my contract because I'm not doing that again. I missed this. I, there was 20 revisions and I didn't like, make it clarified how many revisions there were going to yeah. be. Um, yeah. Or I ended up paying a bunch of luggage fees because my equipment was too much. So I got to put that in my contract. Meals and like, yeah, there's yeah, all per, these things. Diem and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you, you start to, you learn from those experiences and those aren't that painful to learn those lessons. Um, and that's why it's always, you should be charging way more than you think that the project's going to cost even on an hourly rate if you're like oh i, I want to make 50 dollars an hour on this like you should probably be charging which w would give you a 75 dollars an hour return because there's always going to be extra expenses there's always going to be more time um and also you got to think about all the extra time that you're working on sending emails back and forth, getting on the phone. And that's why we don't charge hourly because I don't think anybody would enjoy that knowing every time they pick up the phone, it's kind of like that, um, you know, penny smart dollar dumb, you know, the client would be thinking, oh, this is costing money right now to be on the phone with this person. When around, of course, every time you get on the phone with somebody, like they're providing an expertise, it's just under a project rate. Yeah, and one thing I do with my proposals is I list out 
all of the things that we do. And I try to break down where the money goes or which things cost a certain amount. So pre-production, I'll list out all the different things we'll do for pre-production. Like if you have a script, we'll review the script. We're going to load in the teleprompter. We're going to pack all our gear. We're going to schedule the shoot date. We might find the location and scout it out and like all that stuff, put a price on it. Mm -hmm. Production day, there's going to be, it's going to be this, this many hours, this many people, price it out. Editing, we're going to do that. These videos, they're going to be approximately this long. It's going to take us this long, this price, like equipment, like line by line by line. Once I started doing that, I felt more justified in being able to charge more because then I could see, oh, well, that's going to take a bunch of time. That's going to take a bunch of time. Like this equipment takes this much money to rent and then we're going to edit it for a couple of weeks. And so it justifies it more instead of them seeing $10,000 or $20,000 and not really knowing. Yeah, and you have to be ready uh, for that client to ask you, why does it cost this much? Okay, this is why. And it's good to explain. And and you can just say like, yeah, the director fee for the day is $4,000, right? Like you can have a high rate as somebody who's, you know, a creative person in the industry. DPs, you see that like a DP rate might range from $250 a day to $15,000 for a day, depending on how much experience they have, how good they are, how much, um, pro- how many projects they've done in the past. So those things can vary. And that's where you can kind of start to increase your rate depending upon, um, how how much in demand you are because it's really that's that's what the economy is and a free market is is like yeah you can charge anything you want and that person can choose not to work with you if it's too expensive yeah it's hard to it's also hard to like get the price from them and like who's gonna say the number first oh, I love that. Yeah. love that game but but you should know you should be able to know roughly how much someone's gonna charge or or want to pay and You know, I go back and forth on whether one of your first interactions with them should be budget related or not. You know, if in the the survey of like, hey, tell me about the project and that sort of thing, like give me a ballpark budget Um, because that can pigeonhole you into something low or or, you know, or scare them away or scare them away. But you also don't want to be on the phone with people that only have two hundred dollars. So there is some. Yeah, what I do in those situations is uh, I, I got into a habit of never giving a price, never giving the ballpark figure. Like, sorry, you know what? Like, I, I just need to write this all out. Like we were saying, create mm-hmm. a list of like, what's this going to cost? And realistically, that doesn't take a very long time. And But it does take a pause. And, and one of the main reasons is that I know on the phone, I'm not going to be as confident with my price and say, Fifty thousand dollars, and like that's it. Boom, that's the price of what this is going to cost. Um, I'd be like, well, it's much you easier know what? In an email it's going to be, be like, like fifty thousand. <laughs> like my voice just changes and gets like very sensitive. Um, but yeah, I and it's also like I wouldn't even put it in the email. I just through fresh books, I would create like a an estimate, and it would just be like you know maybe even a couple line items, production, post production, but pretty vague or royalty free music costs. Maybe just a couple line items, uh, and then fifty thousand dollars, and then. That to me, I can be like, oh, it attaches an estimate. Let me know if you have any questions or thoughts or whatever. And then that point, you know, they can say, oh, you know, that's way out of our budget. Sorry, we didn't think that. Oh, okay, well, maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do a half day instead of that if you want to, right? There's, you have to be willing to have that conversation and you have to be able to make sure that first time that you show them the price of what this is going to cost, uh, you kind of, you do it in the right way. Yeah, I, I like having it further down. I don't feel like it's sneaky to be like, oh, put the price at the end. I do feel like it gives you the opportunity to justify it, though. You can you can explain what the process is going to be, some of your experience. You could show some of your work. You can explain all the line items of like pre-production, filming, editing, mm-hmm. all the different steps. Then they see the big number. I don't want to be like, that's going to be about $50,000, and they balk at it. You right, know. they don't know what goes into it. Yeah, and then I, I will caveat that to say that there have been times when I get an email from somebody who's like asking to work with me, and I just I can just tell you, you can, can tell you can. from the email this person has five hundred dollars to spend, and that's it. Uh, in which case, I would say. Uh, you know, uh, projects usually start, I mean, start at $10,000 or whatever, but it's, uh, it really varies depending on projects. So once we get on the phone, we can talk about it and that will scare away a lot of people, which will save you so much time. Yeah. The starting at is something that you can save time from. Um, I know some people put that right by their contact form. Oh, actually, yeah. What I would do even in the form is like, what's your budget? And like start, you know, 10000 to $20,000 is the first budget range. And then people be like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and then they have to select one. So if they're messaging me, they're choosing the 10 to 20. They're not, you know, just. So they already know. They have to yeah. fill it in and, yeah. and actually kind of agree to it. 
Um, any more thoughts on freelancing? I got we have some questions here that I want to answer from Instagram, but uh, I want to make sure that I we cover if there's anything that we didn't talk about. Yeah, yet, freelancing. I mean, the biggest thing for me is knowing the kind of company you want to build. And so initially, I thought I wanted a full production company. I thought I wanted the 10 people yeah. um, like that Adam Lissagor of Sandwich Video has, and they do like the product explainer videos, and they have motion graphics people, and they're producers, and they have all the, like they have the crew. They can do all the stuff, and they can hire contractors. But I found that I wanted it to just be me. I wanted to be lean. I wanted to be nimble. I do have an editor that I work with and he helps with some other stuff as well, like helping me shoot sometimes. But I think you need to know what kind of company you want because that's going to determine the math. Mm -hmm. That's going to determine how much you can charge, how many clients you need, that sort of thing. And so I know the size of the company I want and the kind of work I want to do. And that determines what I can charge. Mm. Yeah, I love the the mentality of, of starting small and staying small. I think by our nature, we have this more, know, expectation, more, more, yeah. right, to like to, to build, to grow, to whatever. And like, um, there are ways to grow both as a person and as a company without scaling up in size and, and getting more employees. Yeah. And to me, it was staying lean enables me to say no to the clients that I don't want. But when you have payroll, when you have a 10% profit margin, you got to be always saying yes you got to be always doing always doing mm. the work and, and and you can also take better care of the clients you have rather than chasing the new project and i see that a lot with larger agencies where they care more about landing a new project than they do about the ones that are already paying them and to me that just seems so backwards it's like why don't you care about the people that you know have become a lot of times you're working so close with these people, they become friends, you know, they're, they're clients, but you're also, you build this intimate relationship with them. And all of a sudden you're going to be like, well, I can't spend as much time working on that project. Or maybe we're going to cut corners here because we really need to, you know, get an extra. Land the next one. Yeah. Land the next one. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. Great. Let's go. I said great instead of great. Uh, great. <laughs> Let's go into Instagram questions. Uh, I got a question here from Duraj Maki. How do you make meaningful content without constant access to interesting subject matter? In other words, what is the least amount of stuff you need to make an interesting film or video while still being able to tell a story? Obviously, I could sit in front of a camera and talk, but I'm wondering about ways to create a narrative without using my face in it. <laughs> I, think, I should have had a photo there just for clarification oh. so you can see their face. No, I don't have it. No, I think that that is something that that is a struggle that a lot of people have yeah. for doing creative work, maybe not being in a creative location or they want to make content about certain things that they don't have, or they only have their phone. And those types of limitations are definitely real. Um, I would say that there are a lot of resources out there that you can use to tell whatever you want to tell. You can pull, there's, there's plenty of free music archives out there. There's free photo archives there's film archives from from the US government that you can access you know that are public that you can just pull stuff from that's not copywritten anymore and maybe get creative with stuff i you know there's a lot of there's like world war 2 documentaries and all that stuff is public domain that you can use to to tell the story you want to tell maybe you're not interested in world war 2 but maybe there are ways that graphically you could show stuff or do the Casey Neistat top down, draw on a piece of paper with a marker and tell the story that way. And mm -hmm. I think not having all the resources, all the gear, all the equipment living in the exact spot, you know, that gives you more opportunities for your creativity. The, the constraints lead to that. Yeah. And that's one thing that you see with a lot of designers is that the constraints help them create. So if they're dealing with, if they're creating an Instagram post and it's just, or say somebody's creating an app, you have this screen, you have this finite amount of space that you can fill and that dramatically changes how you're going to be creating this versus an iPad app versus a, a desktop, um, you know, website. It radically changes how you're creating. All of a sudden now buttons have to be a certain size so they're visible. All of a sudden you, you have to cut out 90% of the content that you might add in otherwise. And I think the same thing happens if you are, say, a video creator living in a shitty apartment with no natural light. You have to find different ways to get creative with 
your videos. And there's no reason why you can't create a low budget approach, like buying a light from Home Depot and figuring out ways to get creative. Like you said, marker, get you know a marker and get some poster board. You can create some really cool things. Stop animation. You like. The one thing that I did was my Brooklyn apartment wasn't that great for filming in. Like I didn't have a great setup for it. Uh, so even for the intro of this podcast, it was all like, how do I just go really micro with it and shoot really close up shots of like coffee being poured mm-hmm. and grinds of coffee because I didn't have a beautiful studio or a beautiful kitchen to film these shots in. Uh, so it makes you get more creative. And a lot of times we see that final thing and we're like, oh, that's cool. That was his vision. And it was like, Kind of, but really it was mostly like I was dealing with the constraints that I had in that situation. Yeah, having a having a crappy environment to film <laughs> in is a restraint. It helps you just choose what you're gonna show. And and photography and filmmaking, it's it's about cropping. It's like cropping out the distractions and framing stuff that's beautiful. Yeah. And that's why I love seeing behind the scenes photos, because you know, you don't see any of that stuff. You don't see the 30 people standing behind the camera and the set and everything like that. It's in movies. You just focused on what they, what they put in the frame. What fits in the frame. And dude, look at the podcast, like what we're doing right here. This is, this is not the ideal situation. Like I would love to have a separate studio or a room where I could just put all this stuff up, leave it up. This is in my dining room and it's the least ideal scenario to have to break up and set down every single episode. But I'm not making any money from this right now. Like this is very much building from the ground up. So like we have to good name plug. Thank you. (laughs) Yeah. No, I was like, should I do it? Should I do it? I'm going into it. I'm saying it. And then, um, you know, it, it's for now, this is working and it's helping me to build it. And people want to see that they want to see, um, I mean, picture yourself like successful in five years at what you're doing, have an audience or making a living doing what you want to do. Being able to look back at the very beginning, you know, when you, you were in that shitty apartment making those videos, like that's going to be really cool to be for people to be able to see and for you yeah. to look on. Yeah, that's one of the last things I would say to him is go scroll back through whoever you think now has everything that you want and go to their first videos and see what they did and see how creative they got. Mm-hmm. And um, Marquez Brownlee, MKBHD, is someone that I, I watch a lot of his stuff on YouTube and he's progressed a lot over the last 10 years, thousand videos, millions of subscribers. And now he has a studio space and he has whatever equipment he could want and people helping him and that sort of thing. But I remember one thing he said was he used to film in the bedroom of his apartment when he was in college and he built like a huge audience doing that, making videos in similar styles. And at one point he said, I think I filmed in every direction possible with every possible thing behind it, every lens, like the yeah. phone pointing and like, you just, when you have constraints, you find a new way to point the camera. You find a new way to light it. And mm-hmm. that is going to push your creativity a little bit more. Valerie from the Netherlands. I'm a freelance videographer, and I was wondering if you have any tips for backing up footage to make sure you don't lose important data. So I always make sure I have three copies of things. Wow. You freak. I only do two. You only do two? Yeah. So Why three? Um, three while I'm working on it. Once, okay. once it's delivered, two is enough for me. So when I film, if I use a camera, if possible, I'll do dual memory cards to like mm-hmm. C 100. So that's two copies. Okay. And then anytime I'm moving the stuff. So if I'm transporting do the you camera, keep all the original cards. Oh no. Oh, okay. No. So this okay, is like you. from capture, but like anytime I'm moving the equipment, so I'm going from one location to the other, I will take one out, put it in my pocket. And so even if the camera gets stolen, I always have a copy. So I'm like always Dude. keeping track that way when possible. But once it's on a computer, I I make a second copy. Now I have a RAID system, but before it was just like one hard drive, other hard drive, and then a third one that I send to my editor. So that's the third copy. But even for my wife's wedding photography, she has two hard drives plugged into her computer all the time. I use an app called Carbon Copy Cloner. It's always making sure that those are the same. And then I have a third one that I plug in like every week or so. And then I either lock that up or I put it at another physical location. So Mm -hmm. I'm really like concerned about that. I would never want to lose footage. But then once I deliver stuff and stuff's finished, then I have a version of it in the cloud that I've used to deliver them 
via Dropbox or frame.io or something like that. And then my two local copies are fine at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I actually, with, it depends if it's a big project, I will do the third copy. I am working on a new doc now. So, and like we, we spent a lot of money on the like one show that we filmed. It was Josh and Ryan from the minimalist giving a talk downtown 300 people came mm-hmm. um we filmed it with five cameras we spent a lot of money on the space on the lights on the crew it was a lot invested into that one day and i was like all right we need to make sure like that it's crazy to think about it right all the planning months of planning up to this project we shoot it it was just one day that moment and now we have these car everything is now on a hard drive and we obviously back it up on the very same day. So we have two copies. And then I went and made a third copy, gave it to Josh. You so buried it in a hole. I buried it in, in a Montana. hole. Somewhere, yeah, somewhere in Montana. <laughs> and um, no, but I gave it to Josh because like separate location is important because if somebody breaks into the apartment or if the apartment burns down or whatever, you know, you, you have to make sure that, that that footage is secure. And definitely during the middle of a project, especially a big one, I would say three copies is, is important. Like if it's, if you can't, if you don't have enough money to pay the person back the money that they spent on it, make sure there's three backup copies. If you're like, well, it's like a really small project and maybe it's like not that big of a deal to have three, um, but always have at least one well, they extra say, version. They always say two copies is one and one copy is none. Oh, yeah. That's the that's the, the backup saying, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I'm going to have to re-listen to what you just said about backing up because I feel like you have a better system than I do in terms of um doing that but i feel like any as long as you're keeping it backed up that's step number one ckc also known as chris from boston how do you put effort and passion into a project when nobody is watching noticing or buying that's the best time to put effort and passion into it because because it doesn't matter like you do it for you and then when you have an audience, when you have people paying attention, then maybe you'll keep doing it for you and you won't do it for them. And every, everyone starts somewhere. Everyone uploads their first video or takes their first photo and posts it on the internet or gets their first follower or writes their first blog post or book or what have you. And so you should start whatever it is you want to do because you want to do it, not because other people are going to, to like it or favorite it or share it. So I think that's a strong place to be in mentally. It's a frustrating place to be in when you post something and it gets five views or it gets 10 Mm -hmm. readers. But the goal is that you'll look back at that time and be like, I still made what I wanted to make Mm -hmm. and I'm still doing that. Even if I have way more people paying attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You have, it's just, it's part of the process. If you want to, be able to be successful in a given field you have to keep doing it and you have to get through that part that painful experience of of creating without people watching or giving you feedback and it's a little bit um numbing i would say in the beginning but you get used to that feeling very quickly and like you're just like well i decided i'm gonna do an episode a week or a video a week and i am that's what i'm committed to doing and i'm gonna keep doing that and then if you have that kind of consistency, not only are you getting better, you're starting to build up a little bit of an audience. People start coming back and then yeah. you create something. And you also, you don't need an audience of a million people. You know, you just need an audience of the right people. Yeah. In the history of the world, except for the last 10 years, let's say, whatever you made creatively was really hard to get anyone to pay attention to because there, okay, even if there was the internet, there were there weren't platforms like YouTube, like Instagram, like no one would have seen it anyway. Mm-hmm. Like I was just watching. Have you seen the Spielberg documentary on HBO? No, not yet. Like he used to make movies when he was a kid, you know, real to real, like film movies just for fun. And no one watched those. He watched them. He made them when he was a kid because he wanted to make them. And then eventually, now millions of people watch his stuff, and. I think that's a problem now with the expectation of I can't make something if all these people aren't going to watch it. Yeah, dude, that's so true. I I feel the same way. Like that's when I started, I started making like VHS, my parents VHS tape. And I was just like, we'd make stop motion videos or we'd make, uh, you know, horror films. 
And it wasn't because we wanted to put it on YouTube to get a bunch of views. There was no YouTube. We just thought it was fun. It was just fun to create something. And you have to find that love in the beginning. And if you don't have that, maybe you're in it for the wrong reason. And like we were talking about with Jason, like the number always is moving. So Mm -hmm. you can be excited about 10 views, but you're going to want 100. You're going to want 1,000. You're going to want 10 million. So you never should be doing it for the number Mm -hmm. because it's just going to keep moving further away from you. A couple more questions. Hugo Bravo. What a cool name. That's a sweet name. That's a dope name. Uh, Do you have any advice for people trying to grow their social media awareness and build an audience on Instagram and YouTube in 2018? Pick something specific and stick to it. That would be what I would recommend to people. Um, It's hard to be a generalist and to have people pay attention to you uh, or to just vlog your life or try to be entertaining or what have you, especially on a YouTube, on an Instagram to just take photos of your life and to grow from zero to a thousand or however many you think would help you break through. I think you gotta, you gotta pick something. You gotta be like, I'm going to be known for taking unique food photos of like just bananas or like, you don't have to get that specific. (laughs) That's really good. We just started somebody's business. (laughs) Yeah. Bananagram. Bananagram. That's great. I actually hate Banana Grams, that game. Have you ever played that game? Uh, it's like Scrabble, and you like pour them all out. My and... siblings have played it, but okay. I've never played it. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've seen it around. Isn't it like this is not sponsored it's, it's by like Banana Grams? It should be. <laughs> God damn it! We gotta stop giving people free promotion. Free Although I don't think that was a very good promotion. You're like, I hate that game. Yeah. <laughs> banana Gram. Yeah, Banana Grams. Today. <laughs> um, so, so it's focus yeah. on something. So, yeah. pick your thing, focus on it. So on YouTube, I focused on video equipment reviews and it was like very focused and I've grown my audience to 30,000 or whatever. And it's probably just a people, a bunch of people that like video and photo gear and maybe they have aspirations to do filmmaking or be a photographer. But like if I would have just shown my short films that made no sense or like we're just zombies eating each other or something like that's not going to grow an audience. So on YouTube specifically to grow from zero to something, you kind of have to bring an existing audience that you've already built somewhere else to your videos, or you need to make stuff that's going to rank and search and be suggested in other people's through videos. Through Instagram? Or through, you, I was YouTube, YouTube specifically. Oh, okay. For Instagram, since I don't have a huge following there, I don't know how much of my advice I would take, but from what I've seen from other people, it's being really specific. Mm-hmm. You know, being a food photographer or travel or sunsets or whatever the thing is then people will search for that thing and they'll come to expect that from you and you'll find people that have that interest so i would say get specific yeah and i think see think about what kind of content you like to consume what resonates with you what do you enjoy what kind of videos do you watch all the way through see what's also um doing well like i would actually see that on some youtube videos where i'm like what the fuck? Like this person is just talking for 10 minutes in this video and they're not even that interesting and it's got 500,000 views. I'm like, is oh. that why you started doing? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm like, oh shit. I, 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 I'm, I don't have to be interesting. <laughs> See, this is easy, but it was like, uh, there were, that's the reason why I did a couple of videos that were just direct messages. I was like, oh shit, I could do that. I could, you know, that's a good way to supplement some income. I'm uh, not in- income. <laughs> I wish a way to supplement some videos where mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm trying to make consistent videos. Uh, we can't put, all of our energy. There's certain videos where we want to put all of our energy into and just m- knock it out of the park. And then there's some videos that we're like, nah, I just have this idea that I want to sh- share in a very simple format. And I saw that format and I was like, other people did it. And I'm like, oh, I could do that. that. That'd be an easy way to make additional videos that may also add value and also help me build an audience. And they worked pretty well. So see what other people are doing, but then also don't just copy them. You know, like there's enough minimalist blogs out there (laughs) that you probably aren't going to be able to find something specifically within that niche that will resonate. If you love doing it, go ahead, you know, sing your heart out and, and write about minimalism. But if you're trying to build an audience, you, I think have to find a way in which you can approach the topic and topic in a completely different way. Yeah, definitely. Um, Okay, so this is my last question for you, and then we'll wrap the podcast up. If you could go back to college graduation, what would you do differently? What advice would you give to yourself at that age? 
I would have listened to what I really wanted to do a little bit more because I spent years working a job that I thought I should have been working to make money I thought I needed to make to live a life that I was supposed to to live. Um, I would have taken more risks because at that age, at 21, at 18, at 31, like I am now, risks are less risky because you have less responsibility. You have less money. You have less, less family. That sounds morbid. You have fewer (laughs) people in your family, family, potentially. Yeah. That kind of thing. So you have, you don't have a mortgage, you don't have all the things and you can live minimally. You're used to living in a seven foot by 10 foot box with one other person in your dorm room. So there's just less risks. Uh, uh, there's less things that happen when you take risks at that age. So that's what I would say. I would say, go do what you want to do. Like if you want to travel, go travel. If you want to make videos, make videos. If you want to go back to school, go back to school and you're, you're going to regret majorly if you don't do some of those things. And so when you can think of oh, what am I going to regret not mm-hmm. doing, maybe that's what you should be doing. I love that. That's a great point to end this podcast on. Do not live life with regrets. That's it. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I appreciate you being here, man. Yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. So I am a very bad host, and I did not give Caleb an opportunity to uh, give his plug at the end. I totally forgot. So I'm going to do that right now. I would definitely recommend subscribing to his YouTube channel. The best way to find it is just to Google his name. It's Caleb Wojcik. So that's C-A-L-E-B-W-O-J-C-I-K. Also, CalebWojcik.com. Thanks for listening. See you next week.